Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Suggan, Product and Technology Outreach Manager here at L Acoustics. I want to thank you guys for joining us today as we talk all about Aliza object-based mixing with one of our application engineers. Uh, Frederick, uh, you are coming to us live today from the home office in Marcus, is that correct? Yes, I'm lucky enough to be in the headquarters here in Moncrecy in this very Elisa room, the one that saw the early steps of the development, the one where we do education courses, where we train people, where we do demonstrations and some early productions. And I'm really happy to be with you to shed a new light on object based mixing within Elisa. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, Frederick is lucky today. I believe his sound system he gets to play with is 18.1 and something north of 40,000 watts of power. Um, so if uh, the ground shakes a little bit in Paris, um, it's not an earthquake. That's just Frederick listening to some EDM this afternoon. Uh, so with us today, we have a panel of experts to help answer these questions you might have about what Frederick is showing you in this presentation. Uh, let's start with, uh, uh, let's go to Germany first. Martin, thank you for uh, joining us again today. It was great to have you present uh, all about Elisa sound system design. And today you're gonna help answer questions about uh, using the Elisa controller and mixing in object-based format, correct? Yeah, welcome back from sunny Berlin. And um, I'm, today I'm here to answer your questions. And, um, and for all the people who want to do it in Germany, that is quasi my specialty. Great. Let's head slightly uh, west. Sylvain, you are, uh, are you at your home office today or are you in the uh, studio in uh, Highgate? Uh, no, no, I'm, uh, I'm staying at home today and I will be able to answer your questions in, in Francais uh, aussi. Donc, uh, voilà. Excellent. Uh, Sylvain, if you guys aren't aware, is uh, one of the uh, uh, long members of the Elisa team and works with the development team in Highgate to help work on the Elisa controller day in and day out. So he's a real expert at this as well. Uh, Sergey, coming to us from just down the road. Um, uh, Sergey, coming to us from just down the road. Sergey, how are you? Hello, Scott. I'm good. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everyone, depending where you are in the world. Uh, Happy to be here again with you. Привет всем. Рад быть здесь вместе с вами. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Carlos. Uh, Carlos, we're going to jump to you real quick, and then we'll head to the last, uh, the last great place in the earth, Denver. Carlos, you're uh, coming to us from just outside Los Angeles. Thank you for joining us, Carlos. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm, we're going to be answering questions. So. Anytime. And uh, también puedo responder preguntas en español. Así que con gusto cuando, cuando quieran. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Jesse, last and most definitely not least, uh, you've been a long term member here at All Acoustics and you've been using Elisa for quite some time. Jesse, thank you for joining us from Denver, where the air is clean and uh, all other things are good. How is Denver? How's the beer? Uh, Denver's good. The breweries are closed, but it's snowing outside, so it still feels like Colorado. So thanks uh, everyone for joining us. Hope you're all safe wherever you are. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think between the 12 of us on this, we've got a lot of Elisa experience. Hopefully we can answer uh, all your questions. Great. And uh, I'm going to jump back real quick and uh, hand it over to Frederick here in a second. But Frederick, it appears either your camera has fallen over um, or uh, the lights have been turned out on you. So um, we're going to put it on the PowerPoint screen while you get set up there. And we're really excited everyone could join us. So thank you guys for uh, coming here today. Uh, we can't wait to show you everything we can about the Elisa controller and get started here in just a moment. Okay, hello everyone. So it's a great pleasure to be here to walk you through Elisa. Elisa object based mixing. Now, object based mixing is quite a fashionable word, but some people, some of you know about it and others don't. And what you have to know is Elisa is object based and Elisa made it very powerful and very easy to use on the top skin on the user interface. Now, as you guys Martin, Scott said on the previous days, we're going to change the paradigm of mixing. We're going to migrate from a stereo or maybe a dual mono, so let's call it a bus mixing approach, to an object mixing approach. An object mixing approach is no longer to a bus, you're mixing to a space. So how does it work? Well, in the bus mixing approach, you know how that works. You've got talents on stage, 
they're providing you with inputs here to a desk. And in this desk, you've got channel strips. And these, and these channel strips, each input is going to be game staged. You're going to be doing a bit of filtering, maybe a bit of EQ, maybe a bit of dynamics, because we all know that things get cluttered and you need dynamics and EQ to really precise one element against the other. You need to demask them. And then it will be sent to the master failure, to the master bus here. And the decision you take in terms of space is, may, is based on an electric pan out of 100% of energy of one object. How much do I put to the left and to the right? Maybe here 70% to the right and only 30% to the left. That's how we do in bus mixing. Now, what's the change in object-based mixing? Now, the first change, as you can see, is over the performance zone. We not only have two speakers, we have a minimum of five speakers. And you know this because you follow the previous seminar, uh, webinar. Sorry, Eliza starts with a minimum of five system above the performance zone or more. So we have a band here and we still have a desk. The desk is still valuable. So the band is providing inputs to the desk and in the channel strips. Now we get inputs, we get gain staging, we get filtering, we get EQ, but maybe a bit less because demasking is not about EQ anymore. It's about maybe giving a space of its own to every element. And then dynamics can be on board, although you need less to define each object. And all this is sent to a fader and then post fader. So you can still write this object. You're going to send a direct out to the input of the processor. Now in the controller, which is our software, where you'll have input the speaker data, you're going to give to each channel positioning object data, metadata. And the addition of positioning object data and an audio stream here, a direct out post fader, actually creates what we call an audio object. So many audio objects come in the processor that does rendering, known where the speakers are and where the objects are, and it provides to each hang an individual signal output from the, pro the ELISA processor. So each speaker will have a different output. So how does it work on the field? How do you incorporate this new processor in your workflow? Well, again, we had a program, we had a desk with many channels, an output that was the master fader that used to be sent to many speakers covering your audience zone, and that used to be matrixed to cover the entire zone. Now we have an extra two members, which is the processor here, and the controller here. So the first thing we're going to do is over the network, we're going to connect the controller to the processor. So now they talk. Again, this controller here is a piece of software that will run on your computer, be it Mac or Windows. Then the program goes to the desk and it provides input to the desk. And again, we're not using the master fader anymore. What the desk does is it provides direct output over MADI to the input of the processor. And then the processor, known where the speakers are and the objects are, will render the ELISO program. And it will send to each hang a different signal output that will composite your ELISO program. So, so real quick, Frederick, what you're saying is in bus based mixing of course we define um, a percentage of energy left or right and, and once we've done that for all these channels it's fixed in stone right there's no going back um, yeah. versus Eliza, you're mixing to a location or a space whether that's xyz or that's 30 degrees left you're mixing to somewhere and based on your specific speaker design the Eliza processor will render that for the given mix for the given design day in and day out. It'll it'll be able to update that more creatively and flexibly. Is that correct? Exactly. And I would underline the strong relationship between the system engineer and the mixing engineer, because 
we mix to a room that is covered evenly from sound vision with the ELISA add-ons by the system people. So it actually puts up a coherent and constant sound canvas in which we can pan because the new low is yes, you can pan. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. So right now, let's go to the controller. I've just opened the controller and it shows like this. This is the layout of a controller, right? So there's different parts to this window. The first one I'd like to draw your attention to is this top bar, this top menu bar, this top very administrative bar. That is where you're going to create source, create groups or delete them. You're going to create snapshots, reverb, and you're also going to do settings. But moreover, if you go here to the processor tab, that's where you're going to connect to processors because that's the, th that's the first thing you want to do. So here in this square is my computer. That's my name. That's the Wi-Fi so I can talk to you. And here I'm controlling, I'm, I've declared a NIC, a network interface here, which is 192.168.1223. That's my IP address. You have two wells, so you can have two processors to connect to, and they would act as mirror. One would be main, and the other one would be backup. They would be holding the same information in real time. Now, in this window here, I've got every processor that is available on my network. So this one is offline. It's been turned off for some reason. This one is available. What does available mean? It's on my network, it's on my IP range, I can reach it, and it's unused by anyone else. DSP is on, good, it's going to be able to render a show, and it's compatible. Right, what does all this mean? I'm selecting here a processor, and I can see its tabs here, like version. Version is the firmware number two, and if you look at the top here, the controller is version number two, so they can talk, they're compatible. And if you go to the network, its IP address is 150, whereas mine is 1223. We're in the same IP range, we can talk. So in this well, I can select this Elisa mix proc here, and I'm going to connect to it right now. And what it shows is a green arrow showing a really good sign of how the relationship between two elements. Now in the backup here, I could have a backup processor, which is in this list and also connected. What you can also see is here in the top administrative bar, the connection indicator actually show you that the main and the backup processors are connected. If I disconnect one, one will go, will show red. And this shows wherever you are in the UI. So it's very important to have it under the eye. Right, I'm reconnecting. Right, so I've connected. And maybe the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import speakers so the processor and the controller know where the speakers are. And my friend Martin has actually worked on a sound vision file of the Coliseum in, um, in Australia, I think. So here in this drop down menu, you see that I can do new session, I can open session, I can save session, but I can also import speaker data. And here, what I'm going to do is, I need this window, I need to show you this window maybe, right in my short links. I've got here some speaker design and I've got the Coliseum and you see that blue logo, which you all know well, this is a sound vision file and I'm going to open it. What shows now is a list of speaker. And I, if you remember well, what Martin said, he had different options and the first family was the Elisa frontal system made of Cara I, and I've got five hangs. Oh yes, I want to import this. Then the subs, if you remember what he said, are considered as fills. We don't deal with fills. So we don't deal with fills. I'm unselecting them, those. The end of balcony were displaced. I'm not dealing with them. I just want what's really coolly related to Elisa. And he had an option for small subs. So I'm getting rid of those. So all I'm importing really is the ELISA system and I'm importing X and Y value. 
if I had different layers and maybe elevation speaker, I would probably use the Z value. But right now, what I want to do is replace the speakers that were created. And this is what you see. This is as difficult as that. You've got five speakers and each speaker has an ID. It has a name which you could change, but right now it's the same name that can be found in Sound Vision. You can actually, if I select them all, repatch the outputs of the processor for these five hangs. So you could repatch them anywhere you want. So I'm going to cancel that. I, I need to keep this patch. And then you've got coordinates for each speaker, right? So first to the left is minus three meters and it's minus 150 in Y. OK, that's what you do, and it's as difficult as that. So now what I'd like to do is go to a more complex session, right? So. I'll just open a new session here, and this session is just a new session, but with more speakers. So really, I've imported nine speakers, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, and you can actually see them. And you can see their patch one through nine, and each has coordinates as you would expect. Now, this gray zone you are actually seeing is what we call the scene. That's the performance zone, and that can be set in your global setting of the soundscape, which is this tab to the left. And you can see here you've got scene left, and I think it's a bit wide. It should have been 3.5. And scene right should have been 3.5 to the other side. So minus 3.5 to 3.5. So now if I look at it from the top, what I realize is those five hangs are actually covering the performance zone. So those five hangs are what we call the scene system. And those speaker to the left and far right here will be your extension speakers. Right, so that's the first thing you see. The second thing you see is the white man. And the white man is declared here as the soundscape origin. So we'd have to tell you a lot more about it, and we do it during the three day training here in Makusi and in other places. But this guy is the true key to scalability for your shows, because that's one thing we know Elisa does scale well. Most engineers that must be with us today often know that we do pre-production in the tiniest space. Space is say for props or for music, not for technicians. So we're very often locked in a very small room. So to code a show in such conditions, you'd need to scale your show down. And by having a constant soundscape origin against the scene system, you actually are sure that when you go to the next large arena, you can import your speakers and what you mapped out, what you panned will be respected and will be heard by everyone. So this guy is key more during the training. And then you see two arcs here. This is a, well, how should we call it, Scott? Maybe duck blue arc, and that's here. Duck blue is very fashionable this year. Uh, duck blue, and it's the Elisa pan range. What does it mean? It means that any object can be panned on this arc, on this pan range. So that means I can take it from this speaker to that speaker. Now, you've understood yesterday that sometimes, as we would have in stereo, you need a lip fill system for people really sat to the edge, the one that really have a bad neck at the end of the show. And for that, the system provides automatic mix downs here. We provide a stereo mix down, we provide an LCR mix down, we provide a mono mix down, and oh, by the way, we've got an oxen, but we'll come back to it later. So if your fill system is here, what you want is to have in this field system only the elements that are on stage. It wouldn't be worth having a percussion that would be sounding to the extreme right here, sounding in the fill system because then your localization would be wrong. You'd hear it from here and not from where it is. Whereas objects coming from stage, it would be beneficial if they were in the lip fill system. So oh, you that's cool. So want... we can use we can use the mix down ratio to choose like what percentage of our Aliza mix in terms of geography goes into all the different fills. Is that is that what you're saying? 
exactly what I want to show you here is it's a set as an automatic mode, so it takes all speakers and reduces it into mix downs. But what I want is I only want the elements that are in the performance zone, so within these five speakers, and I know because I've worked my maths that they will be between minus 25 and 25%. So now in my automatic mix down, what you can actually see is only members belonging, belonging to the performance zone will be going to the sure. mix down. And I suppose that right. makes even more sense if we were doing like a surround system in a theater where we probably don't want the car driving around in the background to be coming out of the front fills necessarily, right? Sure, it comes as obvious and that's the neat way to actually deal with it. Right, ah, so cool. we've, we've sorted this, this out. So the, your main view now is going to be this tab and this main view is called the soundscape. Boom. And what you see here is every gray wedge here is an actual speaker of your system. And every dotted line here or here is the actual acoustic center of each speaker array. So you can see that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Okay, that's good. But we had a notion of where stage was. And I'd like to refine this view to be able to see where the scene was, where the performance zone was. And I took some metrics for it. Well, I'm going to redesign this view. Look, if I press display here, I've got here a button to show the scene area. And yeah, you have these white markers that show you where the edges of stage are. If I grab an object, I'm still able to go through. It's only a graphical representation, but I certainly know that if my acoustic guitar is to the edge of left, it needs to be positioned here. So it's a good indicator to where things were. Oh, by the way, I've got undos, unlimited le level of undos. So I can see where the scene is. Um, maybe I want to see more clearly this zone. So I can zoom in to actually see and only see the performance zone. Right, there's something else I want to see to actually see what my system is doing. I want to see the output level of my system. And you've got here some ballistic and you see that I've got some sound coming in. I'll tell you why in a minute. So um, I can zoom in to see this zone, which I need to see. And I'd like, I really love this view. I'd like to keep it. And here I've got a view one preset. If you press on it for three seconds, that's remembered of. You get the full view, the extents view, and view number one. Right, why do I have things going on here? I have things going on because I I was supposed to have a band, but the singer had a bad cough, something quite common these days apparently. So now I have a doll and that doll was connected to the to the processor and you can actually see the inputs of my doll to the processor. And that leads me to tell you that you can input as many as 96 objects to the processor, whatever your sample rate is. And we can output as much as 64 speaker output. And this, in terms of latency, has a cost of 3.2 milliseconds, which is one meter in distance. Let's call. OK, so again, the top bar, as I said, is the very administrative bar. So you see that I can create sources, but I can also delete sources. And that source here could go oh, I had some ballistics here, they're gone. And if I look here, there's no sound going on because what it takes is to have an input. It takes you to name it, and that is going to be a lead vocal, right? So this is that. This is my lead vocal, and it's there, and it's to the center array, so you can see that it's only coming out of this center array. Back a bit. So now, what you want to do when you're going to do object mixing is feel like you know the parameters and that's exactly what we've done here this object here number one let's open a list so we can see it can be panned anywhere in there because you know from the design and that's your first pillar 
that anyone sat in the shared zone, in the ELISA zone, can hear every speaker. So what you can do is now you are free to pan the object and everyone will hear say that it comes from the extreme side of stage or right to the right extension. That's as easy as that. So it, as a as a creative tool, as a mixer, um, you gain confidence that does, the design allows everyone in that shared coverage to hear all the different speaker sources, all the different locations within that. So everyone in the, the main part of the audience that's in the Elisa zone, which is that area that covers everybody, right? So uh, I can now position anything anywhere and not be afraid, which is different from how it was in stereo, correct? shouldn't be afraid that new law was I can pan because everyone hears every position and what we want to guarantee with pan is there's not a level difference there's a minimal tonal change as to where you're changing and the absolute position will be absolute for everyone in the shared zone right got it so, also, so everyone in that zone hears the same guitar coming from the left everywhere no matter whether you're sitting on the left side of the audience or you're sitting on the right side of the audience, you still perceive that guitar or that person or that thing from that same position for everyone. Exactly. The idea is you can reconnect the physics, the visual to the audio, and that will be valuable for everyone. And this is the first step into immersion where visual and audio actually come from the same place. So you get sucked in the show because of that. Right. So we can pan seamlessly and there's one thing I'm missing in stereo. In stereo, I would have one speaker here and one speaker there, and there's a kind of phantom image that is built. Well, we know that phantom image is only worth for the people sat ready to the center, but still the fact that this object could have been wide was great. And here it's a hairpin. It's on one speaker and I can make sure it's on one speaker with that snap button. So now everyone will hear precisely this object as very, very accurately positioned. But sometimes what you want is something more of a mass, something more of something that has some girth, something that's wider and maybe not ultra precisely positioned. And what you want actually is that phantom image. So you would like to spread the energy of this object onto a wider zone. And this is exactly what we do with our second parameter, which is good for you, which is width. And if you look at the ballistics here, I was on speaker five, and now I'm distributing the object over more speakers. Five, seven speaker. Now, you have to understand that I'm not creating any level jump. I still have the same level throughout the venue. I'm only distributing the sound over more speakers to and become you're not less changing. You're not changing the tone either. You're making it fatter physically, not fatter sonically. Is that correct? It is exactly correct. The Elisa algorithm takes care of that. So you can be fatter, but still that turquoise guitar that he had won't sound deep blue. It will still be turquoise. Got it. And if you want to change, obviously, if you want to change the guitar color, that's what the EQ is for, right? Or the, exactly. the channel strip on the desk. And if you want to change its uh, girth, its size, its geog geography, that's what Aliza is for. Yeah, exactly. So um, what you say is good also to, to make me think that once you've got some width here, you still can pan and you see that the whole girth is going through your Aliza outputs. It's following you. Right. OK, good. So I'm getting rid of the width. And by the way, here, if I've got any data, I've got an initialize button that sends me right back to the default position. Now, the next thing I'd like to have your attention onto is elevation. Right. For elevation, you need speakers. We don't have any speakers for elevation. We only have one flat line here. So what I want to do is I want to import some speakers and I'm going to show you this window if you let me, right? And this is going to be, um, I'm not going to do it from um, a sound vision file. I'm going to do it from a previous Lisa session that used exactly the same speaker layout, but with elevation. 
And now this is what happens. I've got three extra speakers. And if you look at it from the side, I've got a new range here, a new pan range, which is the ELISA elevation range. So if I dismiss the elevation here, I lose that pan range. And now by re enabling elevation, I found this pan range that will allow me to elevate an object and I will show it to you right now. If I take this object, I can actually elevate it. Oh, you're not seeing much, are you? Okay, so we need to change that vision here in the settings. We're actually seeing a 3D scene, but if I had up to 96 object in a 3D environment, it would be cluttered. It would be very hard to dist distinguish. So what the labs did actually when they programmed the interface is they decided they wouldn't show a 3D interface, but instead they would show a dual 2D interface. Oh, how does that work? Well, if you have a look in the display here, you can show the elevation view. And now, boom, you see those speakers here that have appeared that are your first nine speakers. And then if I move this a bit, you're gonna see more speakers, those three speakers that are your elevation. And also the object has now two control balls, right? The first one, the blue one, will be related to anything that's horizontal. And the red one will be related to anything that's related to elevation. And you can see my elevation cursor actually moving. Now I like this view, but I'd like to refine it. Actually, what I'd like to do is maybe see a bit more of the elevation and I've got a ratio to make more visually of this elevation zone. And if I want more uh, precision in this zone, I also have a warp functionality. Now, this is only for display. This has nothing to do with the sound. But now I get a much more defined course to reach one speaker or another. Right. So, so this we can is elevation. Pan, we, can, we can pan, let's say, dimension one or that first dimension like we've always sure. had before. But you're saying I can use the pan now, right? So that's that's the new thing. And yeah. then the second thing is our pan pot all of a sudden got an extra axis and we can go vertical above sure. as well. And and can you pan to just like an overhead or can you have a whole series of speakers in the vertical axis as well? Is there any limit there? There's no limit as uh, what creativity dictates. Uh, if you're doing a dome, a creative dome, you might want to really have many more speakers to create some some paths or, or some virtual acoustics or above you. And that's where uh, elevation speakers could be very handy. That's so all in the design. Sorry. Yeah, and I suppose their only real limit is the fact that the processor does 64 outputs. So um, yeah. it, that then that's the limit is is maybe it makes more sense to have more resolution in the vertical than it does in the horizontal for a given project, for example. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Sure. Well, thanks. So uh, we have done elevation. We have done, uh, and I'd like to keep this view. Look, we're going to take a second preset. So now in terms of preset, I've got the extend, scene all, view one mainly the scene system and view two is going to be elevation. So view one is the scene system and the extent is the full view, right? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about distance. Distance is a new parameter for us because in, in we never talk about distance in, in a bus mixing approach, whereas here we do. What you can do is, and I encourage you to have a look at here, the ballistics. I'm still on speaker five. I have now a fader that lets me take an object to the distance. And what it does is it dramatically reduces the motion of the ballistics. What it does is it tames the level. It takes the level down from zero FS to minus 20 FS which is quite dramatic. What it also does is it uses a high shelf to mimic an object moving away from you. So it's gonna tame the HF content. It's gonna tame it more and more as you go to the distance. And it's all made in a very natural way. And in fact, it's very natural both for sound designer in the way it sounds, 
but also for us sound engineers. Because what you find out is when you move an object to the middle, you're only losing 6 dB and then there's an extra 14 dB lost here. So this really resembles the course of a fader, but this also resembles the way we are hearing things when things go to the distance. Hey, but now, no, one, you, I, what, yeah. what about if I, I, I don't mix that way, like I like to control level on the desk where my faders are, so is there any way I can disable that function? Yes, you can. Here in your sources, and it, that's again a very administrative decision, you can decide that in the processing you don't want that distance uh, level drop or you don't want that distance HF attenuation. That's a decision you can take. But here I needed it because I needed to provide that very natural uh, way of um, going away from the audience. Right, but uh, this is in a way only a fader drop and a point of EQ, you could say. Yeah, in one move and in a very natural way. But moreover, if you went to the distance, what might happen if you were in a room? is the room would get excited or at least you'd hear more of the room than the dry signal and that's exactly why we've designed the room engine with the room engine you can actually create a room that could be small medium or large i like medium dark warm or bright well, i'm going to keep bright and i'm loading this room it has some characteristics but what i want to show you is now when you take the object and move it to the distance, look at the ballistics up there. From one to nine, you get a high contribution of the room engine here. So the room engine will be excited as you take the object to the distance. And what it does is the object is sent to the room engine, but the room engine sends output of the reverb to individual speaker and it, this has a strong effect on how cohesive the reverb is going to be over your 96 object. This is really something that's very strong and very, it feels natural again. So let's look at how this room engine could be tuned. Right, if you look at it, this looks really like a reverb. Any reverb would or maybe mostly look like this. You've got an early block and you've got a late block. Now, if you look at the color scheme, dark blue, that very fashionable color, is for time-related factors. Uh, pink, dark pink, which will be next year's color, is EQ, or tonal-related factors. And yellow is going to be spatial-related factors. So let's look at it closely here in the early block. Pre-delay, you all know what pre-delay is. It's that little gap there between be, before the end of pre-delay, nothing happens in terms of reverb. So you can actually have some pre-delay. Then there's the length and the length is gonna be with this bar. So if I extend it, you see this bar growing. The length is the actual length, the amount of time, the early reflections are gonna be live. So the longer means the walls would be further apart and it would mean it sounds like a larger room. Okay. Now the next thing is filter. You might want to get some HF off your early reflections like you would in a reverb, right? You've done it. And now back to the second part. The second part is the decay. So say I want a reverb that's 2.5 seconds. That's it. How do you tune your reverb to the room you're in? If you're in an arena or in a live room, that could be a challenge. It is true, but this is where we found a, an easy way to accommodate. And that easy way is partially here, the decay linearity. As you can see, the decay is positive. So the density of the reverb in the early stages of the late part is quite high, then it dims out very quickly. And if you take it to a negative value, the density of the reverb will fall very quickly and then slowly to the back end. So you preserve your 2.5 seconds of reverb. So if your room is fairly dry and it lacks density, linearity, positive linearity might help. Whereas if your 
room already has some quite intense density on the reverb, you might want to carve it in with a negative decay linearity value. Right. Next thing is going to be filter. You're used to that in reverb. I want to filter my reverb at 5K. Yeah, but that, this is a, a filter at the start of the reverb, so at time zero, the late. And I have an LPF at the end of the reverb to make it go really warm over two and a half second. And same thing, if you want to change the linearity, it will change the timing of the HF drop over this two and a half second, Re reaching from 5K to 500 Hertz here. So that's everything you're pretty much used to. Now, because we mix to a space, we mix to a location, there's a heavy spatial a contribution. What you can see here is a segment describing my speaker layout. This ball could be an object. This crescent here, this arc, is the width of the early reflections. Should my early reflections really belong where the object is, not spreading out too wide, or should the contribution of the early reflection spread out over more speakers. Same thing would go for gain shaping, and you can actually find it here or to the side. If my object is here, I could imagine that the reverb should really belong where the object is. And if I take it here, most of the reverb will be gathered around the object, then it will have less level on the adjacent speakers than fan out. Well, if I have a very, very, very swampy mix, and I like it, but I need just a touch more precision on my object, maybe I'll want to take the opposite decision as to take the reverb off of where the object is and rev up to the external speaker. So hardly any reverb, then building up to the outside. It's what you can do. And there's more, but you would need to spend a bit of time with us during the training. Right, so this is reverb. So we've seen it all, really. Here in the soundscape, you have learned about pan. We're not inventing pan. We're just giving it in a hyper definition, just as Sergey said, adding pixels to your pan. Then we had width to give a certain girth to an object. We had distance to take it to the distance. Maybe weapon it in the room engine if you decide so and we've got elevation to actually send it in the air if you've got sp uh, elevation speaker now there's one more thing here let's not forget about it it's the aux send you remember we have auto mix downs that were there mix downs but i said we had an aux send and we would talk about it say if you want to mix your outfills differently and have more lead vocal to it Maybe you want to build a different aux send here with this guy and have a different feed to your outfills so the vocal could be louder in it than it is in the stereo mix downs. Right. OK, we've covered all parameters here. What I'd like to do is to load another session. I mean, the same session, really, but I've already filled names in. And you see, as names were declared, there's sound coming into it. We can see the ballistics. So nine tracks, a lead vocal and acoustic, a stereo, stereo keyboard, yes. Kick, snare, stereo overhead and a bass. And it's all there. It's pretty laid out where it wants to be. Right, stereo objects. So it, that means if I select the keyboard here, it's gonna move both objects. No, it doesn't, so, so I'll undo that. They're not really stereo, are they? You need to declare that. And this is, a, again, a very administrative decision. You need to select both and declare them as stereo. And now you have a link to them. And I will do so for the overhead. So linking them. So now, if you take the keyboard, which is three and four, both objects work and move around in the same way. I'll undo what I've just done. Right, a stereo object, you want to reframe yourself hey, from taking a yeah. 
Frederick, um, so I think unfortunately due to the internet, we lost you for like about 10 seconds there when you showed how to link. So would you mind um, just running oh, through sure. that one more time for me and explaining so, that? So we've got two, two here, inputs there. You're out. So I'll undo what I've just done here. In the list, I chose two inputs, two adjacent inputs, and I could declare them as a stereo pair. Oh, so you can take you can take say uh, inputs three and four or four and five and link them. They just have to. The only rule is they've got to be side by JC. each. Is that the, yeah. the the way to say it? And if those eight guys were to be stereo pairs, I'd take the whole lot and just select them, and they'd all be stereo. But they're not, so I'm going to get rid of <laughs> of that mess I've just created. <laughs> okay, so now those things are stereo. So. A keyboard is stereo, so when you move, both objects move. I'm going to get rid of that. But you want what you want to refrain yourself from is to actually use a stereo object and because it's stereo, put it on the first of scene and last of scene. You want to avoid that. That's way larger than what stereo is, and you need to hear it during the training to realize. But that's not the methodology. You can't you can't go away with it, right? So I want to move one of these objects, but they're linked. As you can see, if I select one, two will move. And now I've got these little Alt keys here, and if I press it, because I've got a tactile interface, you see there's a momentary latch. And if I take three, I can now move them without breaking the pair. And now if I take the pair of them, oops, sorry, it was still latched. If I take the pair of them, then they will move accordingly. Let's undo this. Right, but sometimes you want to apply different parameters to the members of this stereo group, and you might want to break the pair, and I've broken it. So now this guy, keyboard right, which is to the outside of the stage, I would like it to be less defined in geography. I would I would like it to be more immersive, but not number three. So now I reconnect both objects and I can move them accordingly, or I can add width to both objects. But what you can see is width is now a segment because this has width, but this ha hasn't. So it's going from zero to 50 and it would ramp up if I used it. So a stereo object can have different parameters on each side of the object, right? The next thing I'm thinking of is I don't know if you if you can uh, find things, but it's uh, it's it's a bit blue. I'd like to uh, to to have more definition visually, and maybe I can help myself with going to the sources here. And if I take the overview, I believe there's a color scheme here, and the lead vocal, and he's paying the check should be red and he's bought a golden guitar right the keyboard player is a girl i'll make it pink sorry girls but i like pink anyway and not the singer but well i also like the singer and the bass should be purple right and for the drums for the oh right i've only selected one member here mm -hmm. so maybe i'd like to have the drums as a group I'd, love, I'd like to have the possibility what all it takes is a shift and you select them all. But once you deselect or you select something else, sorry, I'll unshift this, then your next selection will not be the group. It will be one member of the drums. So what you actually want is to reveal this group list. And what you want to do is select the group and just drop these members and call this group drums with a big Z. And maybe you'll want another group, which is all musical elements. And that is going to be all these guys. And this is going to be called the best band. Best band. OK, we're there. We got it. So now if you select the drums, all members are selected and you can move them accordingly. And also you could have a color for the drums and he's very energetic. So I think he's going to be orange. And now I've got a color scheme for the members of my beautiful band. So I have a first panorama here. I've panned things accordingly to their position on stage, and everyone hears that their, posi their original position, sorry.
I'd like to remember this position and to remember this position, I'll use snapshots. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a new snapshot and that snapshot is going to be called song one because it's the panorama we use for song one, right? Something happens on song two. On song two, the, um, oh, by the way, you've seen that he's playing the acoustic, but the acoustic is not right to the center. That's because I can move it without any damage. I've got a certain window with which I can move an object without losing the localization. And by doing so, I'm actually demasking the lead vocal from the acoustic guitar. Right, okay, so um, what happens, I'm gonna reload this on song number two is he gets to play the bass and the bass player actually plays the acoustic guitar. So he plays the bass to the center and the acoustic guitar is played here. He's not the boss. He shouldn't be as defined geographically. So I'm gonna spread him a bit just to, to make him more paddish. Okay, and that is going to be song number two. So we have now song number two. And what happens is on song number three, there's quite a dramatic effect as the keyboard player is gonna play the acoustics. The drums as a group are going to go back in the room engine and the bass will go back to the bass, but the lead singer will play the keyboard here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reinitialize this because I want the keyboard to be where the singer is, but it's a stereo object. So maybe I could uh, use my trick of alting and move one side then have the other side to the other side and this is this looks correct well it isn't if you look at it you select three your pan is sorry if you select only three i'm going to break the pair here it's minus nine degrees it's 19 not bad but see distance is 16 and here distance is 14. This is not correct. This is not what I should have done. So those elements are the stereo keyboard. So instead of doing things erratically, what I want is I want to move these objects in mirror against the lead vocal. So hey, Frederick, I have to. I think yeah, we've. Uh, I think we're just a little slow on the internet again. So um, and uh, you, we just lost that little explanation of seeing the two keyboard positions so you might want to just go through that a little slower as okay. uh, your internet connection is being a bit laggy apparently all of france has decided to watch the uh, tiger king tonight on netflix no they're watching us they're watching us oh got it, <laughs> got it. <laughs> okay so if i break the pair and i move each object i will come to a slightly different position it's not going to be mirrored i'm going to be wrong where whether it is on distance 1577, 1663, that's not what I want to do. So I let the keyboard be to the center and I reconnect both sides. We know that an object has a pan, it has a width, it has a distance, elevation, oxen, but as soon as you select two members or more, you have a new parameter called pan spread. And if you actually use it, you spread the source in mirror around its center point and its center point is the pan and see I can use pan spread make the keyboard wider but I'm still keeping the axis to zero that's the center weight of the object so if it was to be 10 degree off it would be 10 degree off and it would remain 10 degree off even if I changed the pan spread so back to the center here and maybe I'll have yeah that's that's a very good approach Right, so that's song number three. So now we say this is song three. So we've got three snapshots now. Song one, then I'll recall them with these arrows. Song two and song three. Well, uh, this is quite a jump every time. Maybe we want to smoothen it a bit. And to smoothen it a bit, what we're gonna do is just going to clear a bit the interface. Let's use here a crossfade. And I'm going to have a three second crossfade time to go from song one to song two.
And to establish song three, because we have a, a riser move for the drums, it's going to take seven seconds. There you go. So now I am on song number one because it's the blue one and the one I'm selecting is the orange one. I can fire it and you can see that it will take three seconds for the bass and the acoustic guitar to reach their final state, their position and then their change in parameters. And it's going to take seven seconds from this point to the next one to reach the final song three position. By the way, Scott, don't you think that the drums sound a bit wide on this last track? I think they should be narrow. Uh, yeah, so I'm definitely not a fan of a big drum kit. Um, I mean, so let's squeeze them that. in. And I'm using the pan spread. So I'll, I'll refresh this as saving song three. So you see, we've created a, sm a smooth motion between snapshots. So now what would be great is I'm recalling them manually. You see here here and then here well look there's something great in my band is the keyboard player actually sends midi program changes he does he changes sound on every song and we can have a look at it but what i'd like to do is use his program change maybe re recuperate these data over the network through midi and use midi program change to actually change the pre the snapshots so i'm going to see here in my reaper session and if you have a look here i've got a mention of this oops sorry a mention of his program changes maybe i can narrow this down a bit okay these are program changes and what he does is on the first song that's on the other window right what he does is he sends program number four for his first song uh-huh so what would be the next one well the next one would probably be five and song three would be six yes all right i'll close the window it's six so it's four five six so how could we tune with this here in the controller you can actually input that this snapshot should respond to program gene number four number five here number six and you're done the next thing you want to do is here in your settings make sure that you're on the same midi port and that midi port is going to be interrupt midi that's the one he's using if you look at here in the uh, Reaper, and I'm going to check it, he's using the interrupt MIDI as a MIDI card. So now if I take this guy, maybe I can lose this window so we can see more of the. Um, right. So sorry gone astray if i send so i'm on number six and if i send this program number number four here it's just called song number one so if i take the next one it's going to call song number two and the motion will be made and this one will be song number three and i'm sending it so we can see the motion created so that's my keyboard player actually sending the information to change the um the snapshots so hey, that's Frederick, one thing I'm, to do I, i'm terrified of that um i don't think ever in my right mind i would let the band member on stage control my sound system um, i'm assuming we could do the same thing from my mixing desk with uh, midi program change you certainly can, but I really relied on this guy because he was really reliable and he could do it. But was his was his name Frederick? That's the question. Was he also uh, the sound engineer? He, he no, he was called Cedric. So oh, got um, it. he got was, it. Right. you know, so he was reliable. So, but they sacked him. So really, the new guy is not reliable enough. So I can't really rely on him for that. But what's right. good about it is the drummer now has some tracks. 
he's got some percussion, he's got things that are coming in. So if he has tracks, what we can have is MIDI time code. And here, just gonna show this to you. I've got a track here in Reaper that is providing me with a MIDI time code. So it's again, wrong window. It's 30 frames per second and it's sent as MIDI time code. We're not using LTC, we're using MTC. So this is good. The track is on. And if I select the right MIDI port, which I've already done, what you're going to see is if I play Reaper now, you're going to see some time code in the top window. In this administrative tab here, you see time code running. And what I can do here is I can decide that song number one should be at time code zero. So once the counter hits zero, it will call song number one, because as you can see, we're on song number three. So it's going to take five more seconds to go back to zero. And when it hits zero, boom, he's called. I don't know when the other tracks are going to come, so I'd like to capture the time code. This is song number two now. It's quite a short one. And uh, song number three would be uh, about now. It's shorter than the Beatles strikes, actually, uh, which were already a reference. So, um, and now you've got time code in here. And every time you go through these time codes, relevant snapshot would be called. So we're going to go to zero. So boom, down to song one. Once we reach 11 seconds, song number two will be triggered. That's song number two now. And once we reach 19, song number three will be triggered. And within seven seconds, it will reach its final state. Right. That's very so this is a, cool. This is a, a great way to sync the positional information, say, to the, the playback that's coming from the band on stage or from the the drummer playback samples or whoever's controlling playback, we can actually sync up to the time code and, and have Aliza automatically follow just like we might have our desk automatically follow those same same time code markers, correct? That's exactly the idea and that's how powerful it can get. So now you see that we've got motion for every member of the session because actually a snapshot is a photograph of all members with all their parameters at a given time. So it will recall every member. Now, the singer here is a bit crazy, and I'd like to program some moves to mimic what he could be doing. And what he would be doing probably would be running to the girls to the extreme side and then to the other side. Then he'd come here and walk around and maybe draw a nice heart for the girls and then he's exhausted and he stays to the front. That'd be a very complex move to achieve. And this I cannot achieve with a snapshot. So what I would do, and I'll bring Reaper in, if you don't mind, because we don't have a band. <laughs> no, that's quite handy to have it. Here in the effects well, I've got the lead vocal track, right? So in the effects well, what I can do is deposit what we call an Elisa source control plugin. Oop. Right. And the Elisa source control plugin, which I'm gonna bring in now, is this guy. Oh, look. So the Elisa control plugin works on VST3, audio unit, and AAX. So we've covered all DAWs in the world. Now, this is already connected to my computer. This is my name and it knows me. And what I want to control is the lead vocal, the object number one. At, oh, it's written here, lead vocal. And the lead vocal appears, right? It appears where it is on the soundscape. 
Okay. And now what I'd like to do is control its parameters. But look, I can't. It's grayed out. There's nothing I can do. Right. What we want to be able to do is here, we were changing position with snapshots. Now, in my sources, I want to tell this guy, don't listen to snapshots. You have a plugin which is active and we can see it already here in the connection. And I'd like you to listen to what the plugin says. And now I've activated the plugin as the master of its motion. And now you can see that I've got some moves. I've got some pan and I can have some distance. I can have some width, whatever. This is great. And so what I'm seeing here is the actual representation of my speaker layout. And this is my object. And I suppose I could take my object and move it. That's great. But I want to move it amongst the others. So I want to go back to the controller, go to the soundscape and actually get hold of this guy. He starts from the center. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play Reaper. I'm going to play Reaper. Right. And here I'm going to move him. So he goes to the girls, runs back here. He's so in love, he's going to draw a heart around the drummer, escape from the acoustic guitar, and come back here. Right. So now, if I have a look at Reaper, what you can see is the automation is written accordingly. So we have a bilateral communication between the plugin and the Elysic controller. So you, from, for, from a, a sound designer point of view, that means a complex motion can be created otherly than drawing automations. You can actually very intuitively take an object and move him around where you feel like it should be going and actually hear the rendering in real time. And that will be played back with a track. That's what plugin do. Right. So now I've got to tell you, so you've understood that here this is the core logic of the ELISA controller. This is where every object will listen to either snapshots or plugins. But also, look, I'm playing this silly automation I've written, and I think he should not move. I can isolate the lead vocal, and now he's not moving anymore. Or I could take the decision that it's not isolate what I programmed was not so bad, but the distance programming really sucked. So I'm going to dismiss that and I'm going to make it safe. So this goes dark green. Everything will still be played from the plugin, but distance will be ignored. And if you have a look at the, sorry, at the controller now in the soundscape, distance is not moving anymore for object number one. Maybe I need to. He's panning, but there will be no distance anymore. So that proves one thing, Scott, and this is a very important factor for anyone, is this core lets you filter or dictate what is going to take control of the moves and the parameters of each object. So in the beginning, I said that your controller was talking to the processor and he's the only one talking directly to the processor. And the reason it is the gateway and the only gateway to send information to the processor is that you want to be in charge. You want to be able to filter out things. And this is all centered here in the logic board. And this is very important. Now, a few more things before I leave you, before I go, right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. A few more things 
here we've got the different OSC sources that we can work with. So we have MaxMSP, we can have Lemur, we can have Touch OSC, we can have Usin. Anything that's token OSC talks directly to the controller because the controller natively speaks OSC. So you can get hold of parameters of an object or a series of object or a group from any touch OSC application if you program it so. And you can actually do some heavy and deep programming from QLab directly. Also, the other modifiers that we can use are trackers. There's a lot of questions about trackers. Trackers are often used because we're in a global show equation. And that global show equation requires tracking for medias, for robotics, for video, and sometimes for automated lights. So why should we not take advantage of it? And what we do is we take an output from the server, from the tracking server, and feed it to the ELISA controller. And that will be generating X, Y, Z position for an object, a specific object that will be then sent to the processor from the controller. So among the different tracking situations, you have automated tracking like optical systems or RF system, but you also have manually operated systems like follow spot systems that can provide you with usable um, coordinates. And those people so far, we've tested a lot of uh, solutions and so far we can tell you that um, the tracking from Black Tracks is happening. The tracking from Modulo P and the Kinetics Suite is really good. TTA, that is an RF, that is no more an optical, because the, the first two was were optical and this one is RF. TTA and its stage tracker can send us valuable coordinates, but we also can work on the manual side with people from Follow Me and our friends at uh, Robert Julie with their Spot Me solution. So that is something that we can use. One more thing here, I and a mixer belong behind a desk and that's where I do most of my job. But what would be neat is if a desk could become a remote to some parameters of the controller. And that's what we achieved with Desklink. Sorry, Desklink is an open protocol that was written so manufacturers could, if they wish to, implement in their desks. And so far, people from Digico with their RSD series and people from Yamaha with their PM series have actually incorporated Desklink. So the desk becomes a remote of the action of the, pro, of the controller. But you could say, how about SXL? Because I've seen that the Avid desks can benefit from the same approach. Well, they do in a way. SXL is from Avid. Avid uses AEX plugins. So all you have to do is take our plugin, the one I showed you, the AAX version, and just incorporate it into a channel and it becomes a full member of your workflow. And you can take control of objects from this plugin incorporated into your channel. But where it goes a bit further with Desklink is with Desklink, you can actually control also um, you can actually benefit from the um, the um, snapshot from the console and those snapshot come from the console will actually store if you wish the elisa parameters and the last thing is with this link and i'm trying to zoom in you can see that these parameters like pan width distance elevation oxen will be usable strictly from the desk and from the rotaries and that would be a similar approach with Yamaha people. So the right. neat thing with Desklink so, is you've got your channel strip where you have your EQ and high pass and compressor, and now you have all your Eliza metadata, that that pan width, 
distance on the exact same channel strip and it becomes real easy to just mix in an intuitive natural way on each individual channel i.e object and then you can overview that mix on the Elisa controller that's sitting right next to you is that correct it is completely correct I had this question from a very famous mixer. You know, he, he knew about Desklink and he knew about Elisa. And he said to me, now, this is a lot of parameters. How do I transition from a stereo mix to your mix, to your Elisa mix? And all I said was, well, just use the pan. Just use the Elisa pan strictly on the console. So you find it in, in the same location and you can construct your mix as you would then if time has been given, you'll be playing with the other parameters. But it was from the desk. It was not distracting him from his physical position near the desk. And that was for him very important. So Scott, now we have a session. We have built a show. We've created objects. We've created groups. We've created snapshots. And we've created room engines. We've created automation from a plugin. All it takes now is to go live. And going live is pressing this button written live on air. And what it means is it secures you from here to in a solo in place. You don't want that in the middle of the show. So you want to save yourself from that. And live on air will make solo in place disappear i can't press it and the other thing is here i have the initialize button when i'm live i can't accidentally press the initialize button and i'm good to go Very cool. i have a show it can be running so this so, is like that little cover on the yamaha or midas council back in the day that covered up yeah, that that's what it would be yeah exactly so um Last thing I wanted to tell you is this knowledge is part of the education, the ELISA education path. And this is a three day course, which is good for engineer, uh, system engineer people and mix and engineer people. And actually we gather them for three days and for the first one and a half day, they've got a common ground which they need to go through like system full system approach, controller and object based mixing, dynamic mixing. There's a lot to learn from that. And then those two groups will split into deep learning for the system people. It will be loudspeaker system design and implementation and calibration. And for the mixing people, it will be deep learning into mixing workshops. And on the last afternoon, which is the pinnacle of this um, education session, we gather them for project management and workflow, and we go through things that are essential for their work, like scalability, like what to expect when the geography of your place change. How do you import speakers? How do you possibly adapt to a drastic change? All this is covered, and both teams really team up and share a lot of knowledge together during this um, seminar. And this is really something to consider. So if you guys uh, want to know more about Elisa, please type into the um, L Acoustics site on education for Elisa, or please send an email to uh, education at elisa.com and you will know more, you will be contacted. And that's pretty much it for me. Frederick, that was uh, incredible. Um, Obviously, great job taking days worth of information and doing that in an hour or so. We had a few questions that were pretty common, so I'm going to throw them out to between uh, you and Sylvain and Martin and Carlos. I think between the four of you, you guys have a plethora of answers. Um, <laughs> let's start with a uh, the first one, which is an easy one. Uh, uh, Maddie, someone asked why Maddie, um, and I'm going to even try to answer that one and correct me if I'm wrong, but. Pretty much every mixing desk in the world has MADI. It's the only common interface to get 96 channels at 96K um, easily. So the Elisa processor has three inputs of MADI. Right? So that's three MADI connections at 96K. That's 32 channels each. And it outputs three MADI outputs, which are all mirrored. Right, So that means uh, you can actually connect redundant paths on the output of a single processor. Or, of course, you could have multiple processors in parallel for ultimate show redundancy. We had a few questions about that as well. Um, there were a number of questions. I don't know which one of you wants to jump in on this first. Uh, we'll, we'll go by hands uh, with 
All right. Um, first off, uh, we, we've tried to get rid of the comb filter. When we use with, we're putting the signal in multiple speakers. Uh, isn't that a problem? Um, uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit, Savant or Frederick? Can you guys kind of you know, elaborate a bit on the with algorithm, why that's not a concern for us in terms of comb filter? Maybe Silva wants to have a word on it, yeah. so we can <laughs> hear his voice. <laughs> yeah, so the width Welcome. parameter, uh, it's not just a simple uh, copy of the signal across the uh, the other and the next speakers. It's, it's an algorithm that decorrelates the signal, so you will not have, a, or you will minimize the comb filtering. It has been especially crafted for that. Right, so normally if we send the same signal to two speakers, of course, and they're separated, um, we're going to have a comb filter generated for anyone that hears about those. But what we're doing is actually making a decorrelated signal. So it's two violin players playing the same note, but it's not the same violin playing the same note. Kind of a, is that an analogy that makes sense? Is that maybe right, Savant? Do you like that? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> more or less. That's but the yeah, simplest way to This is what we, we, we are trying to, uh, to emulate. Excellent. And so when we uh, when we do that with algorithm, we put information out there that's decorrelated, that gives the perception of space, right, to make the object less poignant. And so I guess that's the second question is why in the world do I want to use with artistically? Don't I want to have the most perfect signal at all times and all places and sound like it's coming from exactly where it is? Well, so, if, if you're going to do painting and uh, you want to be very precise, you can draw very sharp edges and it's going to look good in your picture. But sometimes what you want is a drop of paint that is going to blur things, that is going to be less pointy, that is going to bring a mass to it and a certain expansion. And that's what width would be about. So it's really an artistic decision. It's like when you look at a video from the 90s, we went HD, everything was crystal clear. Well, it was crystal clear, but it was really sexy. It's the same approach in mixes. Sometimes you want things to be very defined and sometimes you want to blur edges. And that's so what I, width would be helpful I, with. I think my visual example right now is if we cut to Savan's video right now, um, uh, we want to make sure the focus is on him. And so he has blurred the background, right? Uh, using this lovely feature in Teams. And by blurring the background, it's more obvious to uh, stare at Sylvain instead of his background. And we might do the same thing with some background singers, or we might do the same thing with that horn section when they're not the main musical element in the mix. Does that sound right, Sylvain? You like that? Uh? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the main goal of the width. Uh, mostly it's because uh, when we are used to mix on a stereo system, we usually, uh, get this natural width that is created by the interference between the left and right arrays. And when you go into the ELISA world, you get rid of this uh, interference. So in some ways, the first time you use ELISA, you will have the feeling that you are losing a bit of this uh, natural width that you have because the object become really pinpointed as you were uh, explaining. So the width will uh, bring you a bit back to something that you are more used to when you are drawing your picture. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, and then the last question I have is for, I think Carlos is the best one to answer this. Um, so Carlos, you've been lucky enough over the last couple of years to introduce Elisa to, let's even say hundreds of engineers, world-class mixing engineers. Um, and obviously the first thing is a kind of an intimidation factor. I've got all these parameters. Um, what do you feel like their uptick, uh, someone who's new, has never seen this before, how long does it take to get comfortable? Um, and at least they're painting in color, maybe it's not the world's greatest painting, but they, they understand what the different colors do. How long does that take? What's, what's the perception of the individual in that case? Well, I believe, I will say like 15 minutes when an engineer comes to the studio or we're in a session and he comes like, what's this? And when he realized this is so user-friendly and intuitive, it's like, yeah, I mean, I can just run it by myself right now. I don't need you anymore, basically. So maybe I, I'm not. Go, I'm gonna have a job in in a, in a in a year, you know. So it's actually just. It's not plug and play, but it is very easy to use. And do you find that these engineers, like often they come in with their Pro Tools session, are they? <laughs> Um, are they doing a lot of work to clean up tracks or is this usually, um, does it diminish the workload on other things, um, say uh, uh, the amount of equalization or compression and, and they're using a different tool to find the space in their mix? Carlos. Um, actually, they don't use a, a EQ as much as they used to anymore because they have so much space that you can use specialized objects 
in the right position and you're just freeing uh, energy. So it's like actually for us, for one of the shows, the mixing engineer didn't use any EQ at all, like for an orchestra. I'm talking about uh, 100 people on stage. I don't know, like it was like uh, 40 microphones and no EQ at all. And it sounded great. And actually he's, um, he's going to be with us uh, tomorrow, I believe. So um, yeah, it's a, actually a really, really um, useful tool for that. So yep. Well, Carlos, that was a, a great segue. Thank you um, for doing that. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, uh, uh, Scott, oh, may, you I, got one more. may I drop? Yeah. Yeah, may I drop one last thing, which was not Please. really covered. If you want to take my PPT, uh, you remember now that we insisted we had to import speakers to know more of their localization. And if you look at this picture here, we have a very complex setting with a scene system, some extensions here and some surrounds all around. And if I use a regular room engine, to create uh, virtual acoustics, what might happen is you're going to look at this animation and there's going to be a green wavefront here coming up, which is going to be your dry signal. And the red signal will be the room engine. So this guy is sat there and I'm sat there somewhere. And what could happen with a regular room engine is this. You get hit by the reverb before you get hit by the dry signal. And that is unbelievably wrong. What it means is here, if the reverb arrives early, it breaks the precedent effect of the dry signal that's coming from stage. So you get the wrong localization. As you said two days ago, Scott, the nearest speaker reaching out to you will give you the feeling the sound comes from there. So what's going to happen in fact is direct sound could be perceived as an echo to the room engine. Now, what's happening with the Elisa room engine? Because you import your speaker, you know the coordinates of every speaker in your arena. And if it changes daily, then you will import those speakers and they will know the coordinates. So you no longer need to accommodate for venues. You just need to import speaker. And what the room engine does, and there's a pattern for this, is it actually preserves the dry signal to any listener in the room before the room engine hits him and that is different on every channel you remember i said the room engine was feeding every speaker differently with different outputs so now look if i'm sat here to the back i will be hit by this green wave front first before i get hit by the room engine and, and the and room Frederick. engine has already started here yep and it does this independently for each one of the input objects, right? So if we have this venue in the round and we have a, a sound on the left side of the venue, um, sure. it's going to create the reverb. It's going to it's going to create the direct sound first, and all the reverb will track with that position of that object as well. So the way I think of this is our reverb engine has 96 inputs for the 96 objects, and what up to 64 outputs for the the room. Um, versus a traditional reverb engine, even if it has a lot of outputs, it often only has what one or two inputs. Mm -hmm. And exactly. it it really it really calculates reverb for ninety six objects that can be placed differently. If you had that whistle that you placed here, the dry signal to those people will be first before the room mm -hmm. engine is being fed to the speaker. But the propagation time will be different to there, so the room engine will be there before. So it's a very complex per object approach per. of the room engine. And, and that of course updates all that math based on your speaker layout. So all you have to do is just load in the speaker layout of the day and, and it figures out the math for you. So, you know, maybe we could have done something like this in the past manually, but if we had 30 different outputs to calculate the delay for based on a stage position, that would have taken us hours. And this is something that's done all automatically and, and, and air, less, much less error prone. Well, thanks, Frederick, for coming back to that. I think that was a really You're welcome, to... and thank you for your attention. Thank you, my dear colleagues, to be with us.
Yeah, thank you guys. Um, Frederick, uh, fantastic job. I had no doubts. As always, you are uh, the master at presenting this stuff. Carlos, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, thank you, Jesse, Sylvain, Martin, uh, and Sergey for helping to answer questions in the forum. And Guillaume, thank you for producing this uh, from your apartment in Paris. Uh, everyone, tomorrow we have a conversation with two um, internationally renowned, renowned experts, Scott Wilsallen and Fred Vogler are going to sit down and talk with myself, uh, Sharif, uh, the Egyptian magician himself, and Guillaume Lanost, the director of Eliza, uh, all about uh, doing shows in Eliza. Um, for those of you who will join us tomorrow, that's going to start one hour later. So it's going to start at 9 a.m. in Los Angeles. So please join us live tomorrow um, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Be safe, be healthy, uh, keep learning. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.